Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me in this presentation at Anomicon. First, let me thank Ryan Sprague and those that played a role in this event. I know that when Ryan first said he was going to do this, uh, I knew that he was biting off a lot to pull together dozens of speakers, coordinate all those videos, put it together for a two-day streaming event. Uh, but on top of that, make it free. Good for him, man. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to take part. I hope that whatever I can offer here is of benefit to, to your audience and all those tuning in. I know that some of you likely know who I am through the UFO space, while a lot of you may not. So I want to start with a little bit of a brief introduction and kind of go through as much as I can here in approximately 30 minutes. Um, I can tell you this, when Ryan said, yeah, the presentations are, you know, 20, 30 minutes is kind of the target. Uh, man, it's just always a jab to the gut because I've been doing this now for 27 years and to consolidate, just focusing on UFOs, but to consolidate and figure out what the best of the best is, is incredibly challenging to do, but I'm going to do my best today. It will be a little bit of a mixed bag. Some of you, this might be old hat, uh, in parts while others are learning it for the first time. I hope no matter where you are on the fence, again, that you will, uh, get some, something new. Uh, from the next half hour or so. So let's just kind of dive in. Let me go ahead and bring up uh, my presentation window so you guys can kind of start to get an idea of the government cover-up, the government operation to keep this as secret as possible. And I know that the conversation here has changed in the last uh, five, six years. And I know some of you think, wow, they're being as transparent as ever. On the contrary, though, I think that there is a strengthening secrecy around this and for good reason. And I think that that good reason is there's simply something to these phenomena. The government is largely known for kind of poo-pooing the whole idea, dismissing it all, saying, no, no, it's not aliens. It's not anything like that. And although I can't in this next um, half hour or so show you evidence of quote unquote aliens, what I believe that I can show beyond any reasonable, reasonable doubt is that there is a foundation of a cover up here that is stronger than most the US government has ever seen. Why is that? Why is there this concerted effort to keep something covered up that they claim number one has nothing to it, but number two, if it does have something to it, it's more our classified technology and misidentifications in the sky, but, but nothing else. That to me is ridiculous. And the evidence didn't start in 2017 when we learned about ATIP, the evidence didn't start in 2004 when the Nimitz encounter took place, but rather it stretches back well more than a half a century, going back to the beginning of the craze in all of this UFO story land. And we could probably arguably say that that was the Roswell incident that put all of this kind of on the map, so to speak. It created, talk about a foundation, created kind of the root to a lot of these conversations of what you and I are having right now. And it all kind of stems back to the Roswell incident. Now, here's kind of the interesting thing about Roswell and me. I kind of stayed away from it. I was friends with Stanton Friedman for uh, literally decades before he passed away. He did amazing work when it came to this. And he, I mean, meticulously tore this thing apart and went through detail by detail and, uh, and believed, you know, obviously something had crashed. So I stayed away from it for that reason, simply because, look, he was an amazing researcher, a, a good friend of mine, and not someone that I felt like, hey, if I jump in there, I'm going to find something. He didn't. He was doing that for long, long before I was even alive. So, uh, so, so credit to him for really making the public aware of this and that uh, there was a reality that was well beyond what the government wanted to uh, wanted us to believe. But where I like to, to, to start in these types of presentations is with that, because even though I didn't put in a lot of extra research specifically to Roswell, what I did do was take the government's explanation to see, okay, Stanton has taken decades researching this, um, written multiple books. Could he be wrong? And to really look at the Roswell incident in the eyes of the government, there are four different explanations to look at. The fourth is what I focus in on here. They kept changing their stories as the years ticked on, just simply because they were allowed to release, according to them, more of the classified information. So I'm just going to summarize some of the points on the, what they want you to believe and how ludicrous 
that it actually is. And there's a reason why I'm starting here, because as you can see on your screen, you see all these dummies lined up, right? Well, what's that for those who don't know? Well, the United States Air Force claims that anybody who came forward with the idea that alien bodies were being seen or taken care of in a hospital or whatever um, it was, that they were actually test dummies that were being seen that were mistaken for alien bodies. Now, I won't read you the whole quote just for time purposes, but uh, these are quotes from the uh, publication number four, the explanation number four of what the U.S. Air Force wants us to believe. And they were saying that that military activity that was going out there in the desert was actually retrieval operations for these crash test dummies, that that was what people were seeing when it came to the military presence and even the quote unquote bodies. Well, you could do a whole presentation on that alone on why that's ludicrous. Uh, but let's just deal with the most important aspect of this, that the crash test dummies weren't even invented in 1947. This here is Sierra Sam. Uh, he was uh, created in 1949, so a couple years after Roswell allegedly happened, and uh, he was known as the first crash test dummy. So how in 1947 could they be throwing these things out the window of an aircraft, going out and retrieving them years before they ever existed? Now, we all know time travel, well, maybe time travel does exist, who knows? But that aside, it's not time traveling crash test dummies, if you ask me. So what's going on there? And so when you start dissecting what that military publication wants you to believe about Roswell, it starts to fall apart. But that's not it. In fact, they were talking about some of the other explanations for the quote unquote alien bodies. And they were two separate incidents that they brought up. And in 1956, a KC-97 aircraft accident had 11 uh, Air Force members who were killed. And a second they brought up was a 1959 manned balloon uh, mishap in which two Air Force pilots were injured. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's wrong with that one. And that is, yet again, either time travel or the explanation just doesn't make sense. So you didn't need to spend decades researching Roswell. Just take that newest government explanation and just look at it. Just fact check. That's all you need to do. And you realize that everything falls apart. Now, I think over the years, uh, I don't have any exact quote for you, but essentially people try to attribute that as to people just were mistaken with their dates. So it all did happen the way the military said, but all the witnesses were wrong. Now, sadly, most of them have passed away. So we just deal with written accounts and recorded accounts where, where possible. Uh, but were they all wrong with their dates? They all mistaken those other incidents and things that weren't even invented in 1947 and jumbled it all up and attributed it to Roswell? Or Occam's razor, there's probably more to that story. So again, I can't show you aliens definitely crashed in Roswell, and I don't know what to believe. The only thing that I do know, I would say 100%, is we'll never know the truth. I don't believe that there is anything that's going to come out about Roswell uh, that we haven't already seen yet. And the reason I say that, and it's not very well uh, talked about, is that the majority of what happened around uh, that era in 1947 and the Roswell crash was destroyed. And that was revealed in the GAO report. So that's why I say it's not that the even if the government wanted to tell us, the government has already discovered that the majority of that material has been destroyed. Now, one of the other historical aspects to kind of give a foundation of the UAP and UFO topic is prior to the present day conversation and the pri uh, present day investigation, I want to go back to Project Blue Book. Started in 1947. There were a couple different names for it and different angles, but it ultimately became known as Project Blue Book in 1952, lasted until uh, 1969. The U.S. military started looking into UFOs uh, back in 1947, ironically the same year as the Roswell incident. They were seeing things all over the place. Now, after that time frame of 22 years of investigating, uh, the stats that they like us to believe, 12,618 sightings were investigated, while only 701 remained unidentified. They also went on to say those 701 were unidentified simply because of lack of, lack of facts, uh, lack of evidence. If they had more, they'd be able to explain those too, is essentially what they wanted to say. They also claimed that all UFO investigations were stopped 
after uh, 1969 when Project Blue Book closed. And that was something that, again, prior to the present day conversation, they wanted to stress that. And they did for decades. They stressed that for a long time. And prior to 2017, when the whole revelation about ATIP came out and that snowballed into a bigger conversation, that was the brunt of uh, my research for quite some time, showing there was actually irrefutable proof that nobody could deny that UFOs were absolutely still investigated and taken seriously after 1969, and that there were actually procedures that were on the books, not left over from Project Blue Book, but rather present day ones, present day at that time, uh, but going well into the 2000s. I'll get to that in a moment. So it was it was really starting to fall apart. And, and this is going back way in the beginning of my research through the late 1990s even. Um, I was only a teenager at that time. I started when I was 15 filing FOIAs and looking into this. Uh, but again, it, it didn't take a, a college graduate from Harvard to look at this and go, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's something more to this. No, a teenager who was just trying to figure out what the government was hiding was looking at what the government wanted us to believe, this foundation that I'm laying here. And you realize that the foundation the government was trying to build for you would, would fall apart. That the reality was it was building a foundation of something else. That foundation that that the government didn't want you to look at. They didn't want you to realize that these phenomena were real, that there were incidents that they truly couldn't explain. But above, above all else, it didn't stop in 1969. They wanted to say it did, and then they said no government agency. So not even just the Air Force, but rather no government agency ever took an interest in UFO since 1969. Guess what? Fact check that too, falls apart. And that's what shifted me from being that curious kid in the, in the late 1990s to realizing there was something here. This cover-up was much bigger than the U.S. government wanted to admit to. And there was ample evidence, not a page, not a hundred pages, not even a thousand, but literally thousands of pages throughout numerous government agencies that shouldn't exist if what you're reading on your screen here is true. And yet their explanation fell apart. That evidence was there. It was solid. And it was creating a foundation that showed me push harder. And in that process of pushing harder, I found Air Force Instruction 10-206. Now, although that sounds like a mouthful, when you look into this, this was a screenshot of the 2008 and then later uh, 2010 version where they made some changes. This talked specifically about UFOs, unidentified flying objects, not the silliness of trying to change the acronym and whatever, reduce stigma by changing the phrasing. To me, that's silly. I know some people think that it rebranded it. Uh, no, it, we're talking about UFOs. Uh, we should keep the same acronym. But regardless here, uh, let me show you here chapter five. This is specifically right here, unidentified flying objects on things to report through this Air Force instruction. Now, I can't spend too much time on it, but specifically they're talking about these service reports, C-I-R-V-I-S, Communication Instructions for Reporting Vital Intelligence Sightings. And like I said, this was first discovered by me in the, the year 2000. It was not left over from the 40s, 50s, or 60s. This was not a historical document. It was something on the books. And so when I watched this document kind of evolve, because Air Force instructions, Air Force manuals, all sorts of procedures like that, they get, they get modified. There's different versions of them. And yet UFOs would never come out. I produced for History Channel for a long time, worked this into to that show and would talk about it a little bit on uh, various programs that I was on, but it never really got a whole lot of attention. And I was always surprised because, again, the Air Force in, in one breath at a press statement would say, we do not care about unidentified flying objects. We haven't re reported, investigated them, none of the above since 1969. And no government agency has ever taken an interest in them in them. And yet you look at their documents and unidentified flying objects. There's no semantics here. It is the exact same thing that we've asked the Air Force about, me, meaning the general public. They've denied it on the books. It was absolutely on the books. So good job, Air Force. They couldn't really keep that straight. So the question mark then becomes, where did all of these documents go? And uh, again, this is one of those very much show in itself type stories but I've discovered that they were being sent to NORAD, that, that all of the service reports, however many there were, 
were being sent to the NORAD installation. Now, I filed a FOIA there, a Freedom of Information Act request, and uh, sought out all of the, f the service reports filed under 10-206. You know what they told me? Well, learn the hard way. NORAD is a binational command of established by Volume 33, U.S. Treaties, page 1277, subject to control of both Canadian and U.S. government agencies as defined in the Act, and consequently is not subject to the U.S. FOIA. So one of the very few places that they could be sending these UFO records to through the time frame uh, Air Force 10-206 was around, they just happen to not be subject to FOIA. Oh, so no, no one can touch them. How ridiculous that is, however, probably strategic. Because they didn't want people to know that the very military branch that's denied it for decades, denied their interest, denied investigating, denied reporting, happens to absolutely be reporting and, and likely investigating the incidents, sending them to one installation that is not subject to the FOIA, so we can't touch it. However, the answer to what I wanted to figure out was actually in what I just read to you. They were under the control of the Canadian government as well. Ergo, U.S. law didn't apply. But what if Canada had the equivalent to the FOIA? And they do. It's called the Access to Information Act. Now, sadly, I'm actually not, as a U.S. citizen, able to use the Access to Information Act. But I called the Department of National Defense on the telephone around this time. And this was, uh, you know, mid-2000s or so. I forget exactly uh, what the date was off the top of my head. Uh, but I remember the, the conversation quite clearly. And I had asked him if a U.S. citizen could use the Access to Information Act. He kind of thought for a minute and he said, you know, if the, if the information's been released uh, before, I don't see why not. So I told him about these service reports that were sent to NORAD, again, a facility under the control of the Can Canadian government as well. I didn't even mention UFOs, but rather started explaining what these service reports are. And he interrupts me and he says, oh yeah, I've got them right here. And I said, what? wait, what? Now, keep in mind, this was not a UFO office. It's not a service office. This wasn't NORAD specifically in their Unidentified Flying Objects Division. Uh, no, this was just the, the person that answered the phone at the Department of National Defense. So I almost fell off my chair when he said that he had them within arm's reach. He had about 100 pages there. Um, I was able to give him a Visa card. It was the best, like, few dollars I've ever spent. I think he charged, like, 3 or $4 at the time. It was very, very um, uh, low. And sure enough, got these documents in the mail. And before I got off the phone with him, he says, oh, by the way, that's not all of them. And I said, really? He says, oh, yeah, we've got thousands of them, thousands of them down in archives. So at that time, I was floored by that entire experience because here was the U.S. government trying so incredibly hard to cover it all up, sending their UFO reports to a facility that was not subject to U.S. FOIA. All I did was call the Canadian government and they're like, yeah, yeah, here you go. And it was like the most amazing discovery uh, at that time frame for me, just simply because this came full circle uh, to really exposing the lengths that they would go to. Because the one thing that I didn't mention to you yet is that NORAD letter went on to state that even though they are not subject to the FOIA, that they try and honor the spirit of it. And they have some NORAD instruction that in essence, uh, does just that, honors the spirit of the FOIA, so they'll look for documents. What'd they say? They didn't find any. So was that a lie? What's, you know, what's going on with that? I'll let you guys decide. But it showed the lengths that they would go to, meaning the U.S. government, to, to try and say one thing, but evidence absolutely proved another, and it was thanks to the, to the Canadian government. Now, talking about the lengths that they will go to, I'll tell you this story quick, but first I want to uh, sadly uh, report, if you haven't heard, that Lee Spiegel, who was a journalist for the Huffington Post, um, later would uh, host Edge of Reality Radio, has an amazing history in the UFO phenomena, a friend of mine for many, many years. I can't even remember uh, when Lee and I first met. Uh, he has recently passed away. So I hope if you are not familiar with his work, you'll look him up because I think that he is absolutely uh, someone with an amazing history and somebody that you should uh, definitely look, look into and see his work. Now, that said, my next story is one of my favorites. In the 27 years that I've been doing The Black Vault, 
and it and it roots to Mr. Spiegel here. And while he was writing for the Huffington Post, he had profiled the Black Vault and myself a couple of times uh, with that uh, publication. And he gave me a call. He says, John, I'm doing an expose on the five top documents, you know, that are out there. Well, like, well, what are the top five that you got uh, that you can mention to me? And, and I went through a couple uh, the 1976 Iran incident, uh, listed a couple others that I liked. But uh, at that time frame, Air Force Instruction 10-206, I thought that that was something that needed more press attention, something that needed to be out there. Well, he was really intrigued by 10-206 for obvious reasons, because again, government was adamantly denying all of this. This was prior to 2017. So remember, conversation's different. Military was very adamant that they didn't care about UFOs. And yet I was able to show him this manual. But then on top of that, even though I had known about and have circulated the, the disseminated that manual for years, uh, I was able to show him at that time how to download it from U.S. Air Force servers themselves. So he was floored by that aspect. He's like, wow, it's just like hanging out there in plain sight, uh, yet nobody really knows that it's their kind of thing. And I said, yeah, I mean, it, it, needs, it needs a spotlight. And so Lee started to do what any great investigative journalist would do. Even though he and I, he and I were friends, uh, he went to the other side and was challenging what I was telling him, which was great. I always welcome journalists to do that. And he had uh, no response back for a couple of days from the Pentagon. And I remember it was late on a Friday night and Lee had called me and uh, our time difference was three hours. So it was late for me. It was real late for him. And he says, John, you're not going to believe this. And he said, what? He goes, uh, well, I went back to download 10-206 from the Air Force server just to, I guess he was finishing up his article, I think at that point. And he says, chapter five, which is what I showed to you guys with, with uh, UFOs, it's gone. And I said, well, wait a minute, Lee, what do you mean it's gone? And he says, chapter five is completely rewritten. It's all about hurricanes. And I thought to myself, you know what? I, with respect to Lee, uh, maybe he's clicking on the wrong thing. Maybe he doesn't realize it's not air force instruction 10 dash two zero six. Cause these things can get really, really confusing very quickly. Uh, even for me. And I, you know, do this all the time. Um, so I thought maybe he just is clicking on the wrong thing. So I get home, go to my computer, pull it up. Sure enough, they completely omitted chapter five. They rewrote it. It now had to do with hurricanes. And they eventually got back to Lee, and I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially told him, oh, it's just a coincidence. Uh, we were taking UFOs out. Now, to close the story, that's not true. And the reason why I say that is they had ample opportunity to take UFOs out. So let's just say on the long shot, that that language, that verbiage was in there for whatever reason tied back to uh, Project Blue Book, which it couldn't have been. But regardless, let's just stay on that uh, long shot. Uh, they had so many opportunities to take it out in their revisioning of that document. And through FOIA, I was actually able to get all the documentation on them modifying that instruction. UFOs never taken out. So this wasn't something that was just overlooked because I would have bought that. If if 10-206 was never modified, I absolutely could have thought, hey, maybe they just forgot it. That's fine. I, you know what? Cool story. Let's move on. But no, that's not true. This was the length that they would go to. They would take their evidence, the documented evidence that people like me were finding, and then essentially just cover it up blatantly, rewriting it, hiding it, saying, oh, no. We, this coincidence blows our mind too. It just so happened that Lee was doing the story and left a message for the Pentagon just days prior. I think it was like 48 hours. That's ridiculous, but that's the lengths that they'll go to. Now, on top of that, those types of tactics, you also have the redaction tactic. And this one is absolutely taking away everything they don't want you to know, which in some cases is almost everything. These were a couple pages from the defense intelligence agency uh, there's not one or two or three or four examples, but rather hundreds that look just like this that are all on unidentified flying objects. You can see UFO there. They were keeping tabs on UFO conferences. Um, and these were in the 90s, in the 2000s. These were, these were intelligence records that were not from Project Blue Book. These shouldn't even exist if you actually listen to the U.S. government at that time, because from 1969 through 
arguably either 2008, 2012, or 2017, whichever you want to look at it, those UFO, anything mentioning UFOs shouldn't exist. And yet there are thousands of pieces of evidence just like this. And those on the distribution list, Secretary of State, you can see here the CIA, uh, the Air Force here, that's the Navy. You had all sorts of military branches and intelligence agencies concerned about what was coming up when it came to UFO intelligence. For those who don't know, this list up here are a lot of different codes, a lot of different cities on, on uh, what the, where the agencies are located, but this is a distribution list. So when this intelligence was created, it didn't just stay at the DIA, but rather was forwarded elsewhere. So it showed that that whole no government agency is interested in UFO since 1969 uh, becomes a laughable, debunkable statement very, very easily by using their own evidence. Now, I'm not going to tell you the whole story about the 1976 Iran incident, uh, but we'll bring it up. I believe somewhere in the skies and Ryan Sprague's channel that you are on now has a pretty big breakdown of it. Uh, I've done a pretty big breakdown myself on my channel. Uh, so there's a lot of resources here. I would, I would look at this case if you're not familiar with it because it's pretty awesome. But this was another document that had come out. That was pretty amazing to me. This is actually the first document that I that I ever saw from the U.S. government. It was the first FOIA I ever filed. Uh, I, I do not lay claim of finding this document, by the way. This was already out uh, by the time I started using FOIA. Um, but I bring it up because, number one, it's an amazing incident. But number two, it also showed you one other thing, that seven years after Project Blue Book closed, the interest level in the distribution about UFOs was all the way to the White House that they were being, uh, that the presidents were being informed about what UFO activity there was around the world. Now, if there was nothing to this and they solved it through the Project Blue Book era, then why is that? So again, this isn't even intelligence anymore, but the highest office in the land is being kept up to date on what in the world is going on with UFOs years after the U.S. military claims that they solved it. Another point of that is this CIA document, just one out of well over a thousand pages that you can read to your heart's desire. I've got all of them on the blackvault.com if you're interested. Uh, but this particular one I point out in situations like this, because you look at the domestic contacts division, this UFO research, this was 1976, same year as the Iran incident, but totally different. And it talks about how the assistant deputy director for science and technology was contacted about UFO material that you can see is blacked out. So we don't know exactly what that material is. Physical object, box of pieces of debris and, and wreckage. Uh, what was it? Who knows? But whatever it was, was hand carried to his office. They were asking essentially, like, what can they do with this? Was there you? Uh, what, what could they do with this material? Was there any type of UFO research program? that they could uh, utilize and maybe get some answers to this. And the person that wrote this uh, memo, because the names are redacted, it would appear to be best if you advised, redacted, that he should, and then it's all redacted. So the advice about UFO material of some kind, whatever this was, that was brought into the, the office was classified still. The memo goes on to say it does not seem that the government has any formal program in progress for the ID slash solution of the UFO phenomenon. Now, wait a minute. Seven years prior, the government slash military had Project Blue Book and they solved it. Yet here's the CIA seven years later seeing UFO material with some classified recommendation on what to do with it. And they're saying that there's no formal program. Well, we know that there wasn't one at that time. But why say it that way? And the answer is later in the document. Dr. Redacted feels that the efforts of independent researchers, and then a redacted, probably a list of names, are vital for further progress in this area. At the present time, there are offices and personnel within the agency who are monitoring the UFO phenomena. But again, this is not currently on an official basis. So the CIA and those within it knew that there was reason to keep tabs on these phenomena, on this issue, and they were looking at it in 1976. So this was further proof that whatever Project Blue Book was, it was not in an investigation at all, but much rather an explanation for what was going on. Now, when I 
did under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, it's actually related to the FOIA, uh, not under the same code, but it's called a mandatory declassification review. All those redactions that have been redacted for, for, for years, a mandatory declassification review requires an agency like the CIA to go back to the original document and re-review it and see if they can't release more to you and me uh, through this MDR process. I've done that a lot and I've been very successful and had a lot of failures. So it's kind of a crapshoot every time you use it. Uh, it's not a guarantee. But when it comes to the CIA and this document, they lost it. They tried to search for it, they said, but they, oops, couldn't find the original, John. So you're going to have to deal with the redacted version. And there are now numerous cases just like that that you ask for something to be given to you and yet they lost it. Ridiculous, right? The Defense Intelligence Agency has lost, in addition to the CIA, literally hundreds of pages. I did the same exact MDR process with them, seeking that they review all those documents, the ones I only showed you four, but there's tons of them. Uh, those uh, documents previously with all those redactions, I asked for them to re-review the originals, release what they could. They lost them all. And when you file these requests on other topics, they can miraculously generally find everything. When it comes to UFOs, oh, sorry, John, our mind is blown too. We lost it. Ridiculous. Uh, one of the last uh, couple documents here, because I'm running out of time, is the National Security Agency court affidavit written by Eugene Yates that explained in the courts in the late 1970s, early 1980s, why UFO uh, information could not be released. There was a, a, a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit that was brought around around that time frame. And this particular document that you're seeing here is just two pages of a, a bigger document, essentially explained to the judge who had to be given what they call an in-camera top secret clearance. This was the explanation why UFO material couldn't come out. And you can see it is still to this day highly classified. Some people think it's all just sources and methods. And that's fine. That might be a valid argument. But when you add in all the other pieces of the puzzle, you realize, nah, it's probably not all 100% sources and methods. Probably partially, but not everything. Because it plays into a much bigger story of how they want to cover absolutely everything up. Now let's fast forward. This is the root of secrecy today. This is what's called the Security Classification Guide. Uh, this was a big get for me through FOIA, even though what you're seeing here is entirely cl uh, classified and redacted. Uh, there was material to see uh, in the preceding pages. I did a whole presentation on this as, as well, if you're interested and dissected the document. But why I show you this is to show you that everything in related to uh, everything related to UAP at this point today, 2023, is entirely classified, 100% across the board. The minute a document is created about a UAP or UFO, it is classified. Why? Because of this document here. And you can see here this section, Intelligence Collection Exploitation, Analysis, and Products. And I want to know, what are they exploiting? They reverse, you know, people are talking about reverse engineering. Are they exploiting the technology, whether it be foreign? Yeah, it's probably what it is. But if it's all unidentified aerial phenomena, what is it that we're actually talking about? Because when it's a Chinese spy platform, you have high definition photographs leaked and then later officially uh, acknowledged from U2 pilots snapping pictures. But when it comes to actual UAP, the real ones, then all of a sudden they won't give them to you. And it all roots to this document here. So that's a, a much bigger story, but an important one nonetheless. Now, one of the last few things that I'll show you here from present day is the fact that they are still seeing UAP. We know that they'll, they'll openly admit it, but this is actually proof. This came out through FOIA. This was somebody else's FOIA request. Uh, and then I dug in a little bit deeper and realized that there were a few documents related to this, but this is a top secret NRO platform called sentient. And the information reveals a Tic Tac shape object UAP that's being seen by this platform. And in the document, it actually shows that there is a feature of this. Again, it's highly classified because a lot of the pages look just like this. Uh, but one of the pages you can deduce that there is a model of some kind within sentient that if turned on could essentially be used 
to detect UAP. And the question mark is, how much are they detecting? Tic-tac-shaped objects, or objects that they can't identify in other shapes. Is this just a one-off occurrence that we happen to see through FOIA, or is this something bigger? And sadly, that document I showed you, the Security Classification Guide, we may never know because that secrecy is getting worse. And just because we're hearing about UAP more, I can tell you from the legal front, it's worse. And that's what keeps me going and pushing for more information because I know that although I may be a little bit skeptical about big claims out there and I'm known for nitpicking every single detail, this is just the tip of the iceberg on why I feel that there is much more to this topic and why I feel that the scientific community, curious minds, academics, even government people should all try as much as they can with, with national security uh, considerations involved, work together to figure it out. I doubt that'll ever happen, but let's do it. And this is the type of information that really keeps me going because you realize this isn't explainable as sources and methods. This, this isn't dismissible as something uh, that's in the low information zone. This isn't something that you can just say, ah, oh, you know what, they're looking for funding for military. Does all of that play a role in this conversation? Absolutely. But does it absolutely put everything to rest? No. There is something else here. Because if there wasn't, we would be able to go back to some of those original documents, things that go back to the 40s and 50s, things that remained either classified or unexplainable or both for decades. We've passed the point that if there was some applicable top secret platform or some test or something to that effect, then you can connect the dots and say, oh, actually, Socorro Landing was this. And yet we can't do that. And it's because the mystery is actually there, despite what the U.S. government wants you to believe. So my biggest, biggest, biggest advice to everybody is never be afraid to ask questions of the government and ask questions of those making big claims. Because by doing that and only that, can you separate the wheat from the chaff and trying to figure out what the truth is, whatever that may be. So I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate all of your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Please, the only shameless plug, theblackvault.com is where you can get 3.3 million pages of records, not all on UFOs. I deal with all sorts of things, but everything I talked about and much, much more is all available there. So make sure you check it out. And thank you all for listening and watching. Ryan, thanks again for everything. I know it's going to be an amazing event. I can't wait to see it unfold in its totality. But thank you for the opportunity to speak. And thank you to all of you who listened and watched. Thank you for the opportunity for me to give you a little bit of a, of a part of what I've done. Thank you. And we'll see you soon.